I would like to introduce Dr. Mata. Dr. Mata is a management advisor in strategy, leadership, and organizational culture and change. In his career, he joins the practitioner and academic sites with more than 30 years of management experience across different functions and sectors in the Gulf and Europe. Dr. Mata is a Sloan Fellow at London Business School with an MS in Strategy and Leadership and is an Oxford alumnus with an executive degree in Scenario Planning. In addition, Dr. Mata lectures at LAU and USG in market leadership and strategic management. He has a particular interest in how to embed mindfulness into work and has already written papers and done research on mindfulness-based approaches at Bangor University, North Wales, where he is training as a teacher as well. Dr. Matta follows the good practice guidelines for teaching mindfulness and is committed to daily practice, regular retreats, and ongoing personal development. Dr. Matta, in less than a week, you, are, you have given us, or you have present to us, uh, uh, another uh, lecture, which we really appreciate uh, uh, offering your time to us. We enjoyed very much the first one, and I personally, I, I really practice what I learned from you, and uh, a couple of in instances, it helped me a lot, the breathing and you know, the, the, the serenity of what you learned. So we really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to learning more from you tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. and uh, welcome all you know, to the lecture tonight. Uh, I really feel a lot of a sense of gratitude to be here once again and to address the alumni of LAU wow. and to share with you some of my experience and learning about mindfulness and in particular mindfulness at work. Um, some of what you're going to hear is probably, you know, from the review of the literature and from what I learned, but some others also is a little bit uh, is a little bit my suggestive things about uh, how I think mindfulness can help in, in different settings in the team for teams and organizations. So I'm open to really your input and your feedback and your questions at the end of it. And uh, I hope you enjoy that evening all together. So what we're going to talk about tonight, and for those who did not uh, make it last week, is I'm going to review a little bit what mindfulness is. And uh, what you will you, you will miss some of the uh, nice videos that I hope you liked last time. So I'm not going to run the same uh, video, something else. And then we're going to apply uh, see how we can apply mindfulness to uh, the leadership, to uh, the leadership role, to the team, to the organization, and then how we can move forward in your probably uh, personal practice or in your organization. Now, what is mindfulness? And mindfulness, as we said last time, and I'm repeating it again, is as old as humanity, is whenever we are having awareness, we, uh, and we are aware of being aware, which means meta-awareness, uh, it becomes, uh, we become candidates to really understand and develop, uh, uh, develop mindfulness. Um, what differentiates us from other uh, sentient beings is that we are able to um, to think about what we're doing, or at least to, to sense and to observe what we are doing. And this is uh, the first quality of mindfulness, is to be able to have a distance from our own experience and be able to analyze it. And this is a very valuable quality if we understand how, how we can harness it and, and live it. And mindfulness helps us you know, develop this distance, what we call it uh, reperceiving, to help us reperceive or to help us deal with uh, the situations that we have in life. And it exists in many traditions of the East. Uh, mainly, it is the mostly spoken about or developed in Buddhism, but we can find traces of it both in Hinduism, in Confucianism, in Taoism, and even in the Sufi tradition and Christian monastic tradition. So it is not like something that is alien to the human experience. Because whenever you are aware of what you're doing, then you have this quality of being uh, of having mindfulness. Now, when it uh, moved from the east, from uh, the east to the west, due to some students that one of them was John Kabat-Zinn. He was a graduate from at MIT. He traveled in the late 70s to uh, to India, and he discovered a little bit this uh, mindfulness uh, in its uh, origin, you know, Zen tradition and other traditions. And when he came back to uh, MIT to Massachusetts Hospital, 
uh, he was able to experiment with uh, some a few um, patients about it, and then he found that they were able to deal better with their pain and with their chronic uh, illnesses. And uh, due to the success that he had, it developed, and then we will see how it developed. But um, as it uh, went into psychology and into the laboratories, you know, of uh, the, in research. It became operationalized, which means that you have to define it uh, in a more succinct manner, some, uh, in a way that you can research, you can do some research on it. And one of uh, the definitions that is useful and that the most uh, of uh, most concord about is that mindfulness is special awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And this is the definition of John Kabat-Zinn. And we will uh, deconstruct this definition to make it uh, understandable once again. So okay, I'm going to explain it a little bit further. And uh, the way we do it is that we apply it to five domains of our uh, phenomenal phenomenological experience, which is perception, feelings, thoughts, urges, actions, and self-awareness. And this is a little bit of my work. This is like a combination of two schools the Cognitive Behavioral Therapy School and the Five Skandhas Theory in Tibetan Buddhism or in Theravada Buddhism. So I find that we need to apply our attention to these five domains and we'll explain it a little bit further. Now, there are many companies that started adopting mindfulness for their employees and uh, almost 15% of the American workforce now are introduced to mindfulness in a way or another. And some of these companies are technological companies, some of them are FMCG companies. Uh, okay. yeah. Are FMCG companies, and you have even the US Army that introduced it uh, in, in its operations. You have the American Bar Association for Lawyers. So you have it uh, almost uh, in any sector and in any context. And universities also have adopted it. It is part of different programs. Now it is, for example, in INSEAD, they have uh, a, a mindfulness-inspired MBA. And in Ashose, they have a club. And in Oxford, a medical center. So it's not only that they are teaching it. There, there are now centers springing out of it. And these centers, they are centers for teaching, for doing research, and for doing practice. And um, I. I had the fortune to visit some of them and to see how they are doing, especially the Oxford Mindfulness Center. So different professions are adopting now mindfulness. The way it started, it started with patients that have uh, pain and chronic illnesses after accidents or having cancer patients. And then because of the success and because of the alleviation of these symptoms, uh, even medical staff started adopting it. So you had doctors and nurses started adopting it. And then it moved uh, to uh, the business community, to lawyers, and then to students in universities, to kids at schools, to sports people, and to the army. This is a Florida Bar TV news update. Over the past 10 years, mindfulness has become increasingly popular across society and within the law. As more and more lawyers have been introduced to mindfulness, many questions emerge, such as, how is mindfulness different from deliberating on how best to solve a problem? How could mindfulness have helped me be more effective in that difficult situation? What actual benefits have you found since you started practicing mindfulness? And how do I practice mindfulness given my busy life? The Florida Bar News will help you answer these questions with a new monthly mindfulness column in association with Scott Rogers, the director of the Mindfulness in Law program at the University of Miami School of Law. It's all part of President Michael Heider's Health and Wellness Initiative. Readers will be able to ask questions and learn from lawyers and judges who study and practice mindfulness. There are many benefits of mindfulness, including physical, cognitive, and emotional benefits. If you have questions about mindfulness, email Rogers at srogers at law.miami.edu. Very good. This is like the lawyers, they took it seriously, and you know how much, uh, you know, under what stress lawyers usually function, and how much focus and the clarity they need in order to uh, analyze cases and, uh, and do their work. 
Now, uh, besides these professions, uh, the, the amount of research that has been accumulating for the last uh, uh, 20 years has been also exponentially rising. And now we have almost more than 5,000 scholarly articles you know, and, uh, uh, that are written about mindfulness in different domains, psychological, neuroscience, and everything, that not only studies the effects of mindfulness, but also attempts to understand the mechanism of action of mindfulness, why we have these benefits. So it's not only enough to say, oh, mindfulness does this or that, it has the benefits. We need to understand why and what ingredients of mindfulness help us you know, develop uh, these effects. The other thing also that is of importance is that every day now there are two or three peer-reviewed articles about it. And uh, so it is, it, it, there's plenty, plenty of work, and it moved from uh, context of healthcare to the context of education to the context of business. So that's why now you have plenty of people that are interested in, in mindfulness. Now, uh, why is it so? When we start, the, the first really explanation of why mindfulness is needed these days, it's because of the complexity of the world that we are living in. And this is what we call the VUCA word, and probably most of you are by now are aware of it. The VUCA word basically is that we're living in a volatile world, which means that things are changing and rapidly, okay, and unexpectedly. And you see it, for example, uh, any small uh, piece of news somewhere spreads like that in seconds all over the world, and then we don't know what would be the outcome of, of this viral uh, spread. And that's why that we are uncertain, there is uncertainty of what's going to come next because of this volatility. And also, we are uncertain about what to do and which way uh, to, to go. And then we have, so it's a complex system. It's an open system, not any more closed system, where we are really, we see how we are globally interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent. And this makes it more difficult to tackle such a system where everything is connected to everything. And then it makes it ambiguous to understand and ambiguous, you know, to, to really navigate through. So uh, the old paradigm of understanding the world around us has become almost difficult or impossible to do. So, uh, so we cannot really continue the same way of understanding the world around us. And we cannot even plan for it. So planning has become obsolete. When you are facing such a world, what plan you are going to do if it's volatile, if it is uncertain, if it is ambiguous. And then you say, well, there's no solution then. Well, there is another way to deal with such a complex environment. And that's why mindfulness becomes relevant in such an atmosphere. Now, the companies that were able to maneuver such a complex environment, a dynamically changing environment, actually they reap the profits the first. Because they could be the ones that have developed this or they are the ones that adapted themselves to such an environment somehow. And you have plenty of names. These tech companies are the ones, you know, really that are in the forefront of, of developing this complexity and benefiting from it. Whereas other companies, for some reason or another, their business models became very obsolete and they were not able to survive such an environment. And each one has its own story. For example, if you take Pan Am, what happened to this brand? The founder could not change his mindset. If you take Kodak, even if when they developed themselves digital photography, they did not uh, market it. They did not bring it to the market, and other people brought it to the market because of, the, because of their uh, internal systems and culture that they have developed over time that forbid them from uh, taking the decision to bring it to the market. Borders. It was one of the best, you know, outlets for uh, books and magazines until, you know, Amazon took it, uh, took it out. Oldsmobile, they could not reposition their brand, okay? So they did not understand how to reposition. Blockbuster video, they did not, they were not close to the client to understand like Netflix, their needs and how they do. And then you have the paper industry, the newspaper industry, how all, uh, all the industry was basically wiped out. Okay, so this complex environment, traditional thinking, traditional industries cannot survive. And what happened is that this VUCA environment, 
would also affect us as individuals. With uh, this information overload, we are bombarded by different platforms, by different pieces of information all the time. And do you agree with me that uh, at the rate of our mental capacity did not change like our environment that has changed? Do you think we have evolved the same way like our environment? We did? We have evolved in our thinking and our capacity the same way? Yeah? It's much faster than us. Okay, so what happens when, when there is like, a, we, are, we are evolving at different speeds? That we are, we are behind, and what happens when we are behind? And what happens when there is a gap? Not only stress, what happens when we are not able to keep up with the changes that's happening? We fail. Huh? We, yeah. We would frustrated, destructive, but, but most important, we're going to fail. Because, you know, how can, we, how can we succeed when the whole environment is moving much faster than us? Now, we have also more distractions. Now, you know how, how many times we are distracted by messages, by, you know, by demands, whatever, all the time. And we have also something that is innate in us, which is called mind wandering. And mind wandering almost happens 50%, 54% of the time in our mind. So our minds are not stable. They are thinking about something else, even when you are in this room. All right? And this is also another strain on our capacity to understand what's going on. Now, the performance demands. In this environment, your boss, or if you are the boss, you want to succeed. And you are asking your people to perform. So uh, you imagine yourself an employee with a lot of information, with a lot of distractions. Like a nurse, for example, they get interrupted 10 to 12 times an hour, oh, distracted. So how can you manage you know, in such an environment? And all of them, because it's becoming more competitive, they are, you are asked to perform. What happens? Something kicks in, which is called stress. And stress now is is is, is not anymore, you know, um, an, uh, is not anymore like a subjective word or something that is fluffy. It is very well defined, and we will see how it is defined in the nervous system and in the outcomes that we have. Stress kicks in, and how many symptoms of stress do you, do you think there are? According to the American Stress Association, there are more than 50 symptoms and signs of stress, and the 11 on, for example, uh, doctors and insurance companies, nobody speaks about stress or job burnout as a reason for people to stay at home. And you know, in, in the UK and other countries, it is. You can have, you know, you can, you can have a, uh, you can stay at home if you, if you are under a lot of stress. And it is acknowledged uh, by insurance companies. So, when, yes. American Association of Press. And they tell you about the physiological symptoms and the psychological symptoms and the performance symptoms and you know. And it, they're taking it seriously because uh, you know here, you may, you may be surprised that the most uh, of the people in Lebanon are under stress but they do not acknowledge it. They do not, uh, they do not acknowledge that we are under stress. Now, now the, of course, the, what, are, what are the results of stress is that we'll be having physiological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral changes that are not adaptive. This is the issue, is that stress would make you, if you are at an imbalance between the outside and the inside, you become more imbalanced. And, and the way it uh, manifests is in these domains, on the physiological domain, in your body, and in your emotions, and in your cognitive capacity, in your, uh, in your how much you can focus and how much you can reason, and also in your behavioral, what we, we start becoming probably addictive, and then we'll see uh, how, how it manifests. And of course, this affects the employee performance and the organization performance. Now, stress takes its toll and it manifests in organizations in levels of absenteeism and in, you know, and in not teams not working, dysfunctional teams, dysfunctional organizations, people do not talk with each other. Every time you're having problems in organizations, it's stress. 
it's not only that you know this is like human nature. It is like people are not able to keep up with the demands versus you know the resources that they have. And when we speak about mindfulness, we're not talking about external resources. We're talking about the, our how we are equipped internally as resources, the internal resources that we have within the people. Now. Uh, the issue when we're talking about uh, stress, how it affects us, is that we have in our nervous system two subsystems of importance. One of them is called the sympathetic, and the other one is called the parasympathetic. And you, the, the sympathetic system kicks in every time we are in, the, in, in front of a physical danger, in front of a physical uh, danger. And uh, which means that there are hormones and neurotransmitters that go into all our organs from the brain to activate some areas and shut off some other areas. For example, if you want to run or you want to uh, fight or we want to fight, we need uh, more oxygen in our upper parts and our muscles. So you have the heartbeat to, to, uh, to, to get faster and you need to pump in uh, oxygen into your muscles and your body becomes tense, whereas the lower part of your body shuts off your metabolism and your inter and the other sides are not anymore functional because you are transferring the energy to where it is needed. Now, in another mode, when the parasympathetic, when there is no threat, you have the other areas working and then you relax. Now, the problem is that this system kicks in even in the in the even when we have an imaginary threat, even when we are exaggerating uh, in our way of reacting to events. So this uh, currently people under stress they have this portion of their nervous system, the sympathetic, very much activated for long periods of time, and it becomes a problem. Uh, for example, and the body is in a way very intelligent, but at the same time does not differ, does not differentiate between a physical and a psychological threat. So it becomes tense, and that's why every time you're under stress, something is tense in your body, as if you are ready to a fight and there's no fight. Hmm? Well, there should be a balance, and there should be appropriate. It's not like, you know, one is better than the other. Both of them are needed, uh, one for action, one for relaxation. But at the same time, if you activate one much more than the other one, you start having an imbalance in, in the way you are, uh, you know, you are working. And then these organs become tired after a while, you know, and you start having problems in your stomach, for example, and ulcers, because you are shutting off your metabolism, because you are stressed out because of anxiety. Anxiety, for example, activates the sympathetic system. And you know that many people when they think about the future, there's a lot of anxiety in their minds. So the effects, the work implications of stress are many. One of them is on the self. You have decreased satisfaction, depression, anxiety, slipping into addictive habits like well, eating, drinking, uh, anything, you know, uh, browsing the internet impulsiveness, disruptions of sleep patterns, all of them are symptoms of stress on a self level, on a personal level. Then you have your task. The task, you become disengaged, uh, bored, uh, bored at work, decreased focus, diminished clarity, productivity, and effectiveness. And you know that the levels of engagement currently of the workforce are much less than they used to. You barely have 30% of your workforce fully engaged. The other ones are much less according to Gallup, uh, you know, reports, recent Gallup reports. So um, and when it comes to your relationship with the other, again, it is affected by stress. What happens is that you, you have less empathy, you know, uh, and you have less impatience, and you don't care about the relationship with the other. You became self-enclosed. You don't care about the other. You have your own pain, so the others are not important. And then the organization as a whole starts suffering in absenteeism and in dysfunctional teams and in a weak culture and less innovation and productivity and in higher turnover. And if you are in HR, if you are you're having your own companies, then this is really serious. But uh, you know, so uh, for stress, there is every, there is something for for each one of you, you know. And then the environment as a whole, the climate, citizenship becomes also less. 
you don't care about environmental issues, about political issues, or you have bitterness rather than understanding of what's going on. You, you feel disconnected. In a way, stress disconnects you from yourself and from others. Now, what are the mechanisms of mindfulness? There's, there was a study done in 2006 that uh, tried, attempted initially to understand why mindfulness works. Mindfulness works because of three main ingredients that are very important. The first one is intention. Uh, when you practice mindfulness, you need to renew your intention that you want to practice mindfulness. Okay, so there's an intention. And the intention is to be here and now. Today we are March 13th, we are in this room at LAU. So you take your time to really just sink, let this feeling of being here in this room sink in. And this is the moment that you are in this room at this moment. And then full stop, there's nothing to really fabricate. Just feel the moment as you are here. This is the first intention and you do it willfully. This is the purpose, you know, that I want to be practicing mindfulness now and here, okay? Not uh, tomorrow, not afterwards. The second ingredient is attention. Now, when you are in the moment, what do you want to do? You want to be attentive, and you are attentive to the five that I spoke about. You are attentive to sensation of your body, which they call, and you are attention. And sensations of the body are of two kinds. One of them is sensation of the skin of the body, like your touch points with the floor, with the chair that you're sitting in. And this is like how your body you know, is touching the, the environment. And the second attention is, uh, is the interoceptive uh, signals, which means you can be attentive to the heat in some areas of your body, to the tension in the muscles, to the heartbeat, to uh, sweat. So all of the signals that come from your body to hunger. And this is also a sign, if you are sensitive to this, it's a good sign of health. But sometimes, if it lacks the third ingredient, it becomes uh, a sickness, uh, which is the attitude. In mindfulness, what differentiates it from all other types of attention is that it has to be done in a, with a proper attitude of non-judgment. Mm -hmm. And non-judgment, it sounds a little bit uh, strange the first time you hear about it. But when you start understanding that why we don't want to judge the current experience, because we want to live with it exactly as it is happening without mental fabrication. So if you feel like you are fearful, that you are, have anxiety, you have to feel it and feel it fully rather than say, no, I do not want it. First, you have to acknowledge it. Oh. So this acknowledgement of what's going on has to be done without judgment, with full acceptance, until something happens, if you do that for a, a few seconds. You start developing what we call a beginner's mind, like the attitude of looking at it in a fresh, with fresh eyes. Like kids, you are looking at the same thing uh, newly. And this is something very subtle, Maybe easy to, uh, to explain, but more difficult to practice. Because if you can't, uh, the more of the, uh, most of the time, you can be attentive to your feelings, but you attend, you're attending to them with a lot of judgment against yourself, against others, or against the task that you don't like. And this judgment is actually the main reason of stress, the, first, the third ingredient of attitude. And you will see that you can develop this three. And as you develop them, it creates a virtual cycle of uh, enforcing each other and becoming more, uh, becoming more conducive to health and to strength, to mental power. The intention, the attention, and the attitude, the IAA. There's a Shapiro study that I advise you to, to read it, 2006. It's very important. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? No. Count the many passes of the white team. The answer is 13. 
But did you see the moonwalking bear? of uh, we are only we are selectively attentive uh, we don't we don't give our attention to things no that there's a, a walk uh, there's a bear that uh, was in the middle but nobody notices it you were counting the you were only counting the you know the passes you missed and last time I, I gave another video about uh, you know a crime that happened, and there were 21 changes in the decor, and nobody, I mean, you, you don't know that uh, everything changed around you. Uh, so um, it's just to illustrate that uh, you know there's a confirmation bias, which means that we are only looking for the information that we are looking for. So you miss all the information that we are not looking for, even if the uh, the other information that we are not looking for is important, we miss it. And in an environment that is complex, which, what do you look for? You look for only the things that you are familiar with. You know, this is I'm familiar with, this is pattern I know. Therefore, you are missing the real picture. Oh, you're not able to. And mindfulness has two kinds of exercises of importance. One of them is called focused attention, which would, uh, which would make us uh, focus on one thing at a time. And the other one is open monitoring, which when I'm looking at a big uh, field where there are so many things, I can also sense the whole, the gestalt, at the same time as I'm, as I'm able to zoom in and zoom out. And these two qualities of attention are important to develop, is that uh, we need the capacity to focus, but at the same time we need the capacity to have a broader view of things. So this is John kabat and this is the program that they developed uh, initially. It's called MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. And uh, this is an eight-week course that is given over eight sessions, two, hour, uh, two hours and a half each. And this is like the validated program and one of the foundation programs of mindfulness. And it was like, I think in 1979, it was launched. Until 2002, where you have uh, some uh, therapists or some psych uh, psychologists in the UK, Mark Williams is one of them, that developed a program of mindfulness based on uh, cognitive therapy. And it proved to be very effective to treat recurrent depression. And the studies that were made at Oxford made it so successful that it was adopted later on by NICE and also uh, by uh, the NHS, you know, National Health Service in the UK because the results of mindfulness surpassed medicine. It was at least as good as antidepressants. At least as good. And this, uh, this result was replicated uh, in different instances to the extent that it became now prescribed. The doctor can give you the choice in the recurrent depression whether you want medicine or you want to practice and be an MBCT. And this is also another program of eight weeks that you take also and, and is properly validated. Now, the program, I'm, I, I learned both, and I'm having a hybrid program between both. So you can have clear, you don't have to have a clear clinic or something? Sorry? Can you have, you have Yes, yes, I, I will start, you know. I'm, I'm giving it at LAU for some students, uh, but uh, it will be open, I will be opening it to wider audiences as well. Now, the mindful practices, they fall into three categories. Is the breath as a foundation. Why the breath? Because the breath is with us all the time. It is a neutral element, which means if we are angry, and I focus on the breath, it removes a little bit the anger. It takes your attention from something that is very high to something that is neutral. Also, the breath is very important because it's a link between your body and your mind. It's a link between the physical and the mental. And uh, so if, for example, you are angry, your breath is different than when you are relaxed, and you know that. And if you are angry and shouting, uh, there's a change in your, in your breath pattern. 
And if you relax your breath, you are relaxing your body. And if your body is relaxed, also your breath is relaxed. So uh, the breath is important to start with. It's a neutral element, and you can also harness your attention skills on it. The second one is our body exercises. And the body is important, as we said, the body posture, the body sensations on the boundaries, and also the body and the sensations within the body, the feeling within. Like we, 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 uh, there are exercises that you can feel your toes, exercises that you can feel uh, you know, your fingers only. And you know that with age, we start losing sensitivity of our members. And mindfulness, and, and the brain is so powerful that if you put your attention on anything, you activate something in your brain that corresponds to that thing that you are putting your attention into. And by practice, you are making your brain again alive to keep running for you. So it's important that you remember your body so your brain remembers you. You know the connection? Because it's very well fact that every time you put your attention on any part of your body, there is something that is triggered and, uh, you know, and fires in your brain. So by simple attention to your toe, you start having sensitivity of your toes that lasts for longer as you get older. The third thing are the five uh, M, the mindfulness-based uh, five, which is we, we, uh, we take care that we have perception that is important, the feeling, the thoughts, the urges, actions, and the awareness in the middle, or meta-awareness that we want to develop. There is no human being that does not have these five, but one of them, one of them is underutilized, which is awareness, so they are not aware that they are aware, okay? And uh, the second one is that there is uh, an, overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming activation of the thought and the action. We don't feel, we don't perceive, as if you know we are just living in our minds. And, and, uh, and mindfulness, again, brings you back to all these five ingredients. And when you develop the meta-awareness, you become even stronger, because then you start balancing the other four. And this is what is important. So if you, now, if you think about, or if you feel anything, you would see that it falls into one of these categories. What happens when you practice mindfulness? Every time, there are intervention mindfulness that they, you know, that they do in the lab, and they are using fMRI, and a really structural MRI. And this is like to see the activation of your mind uh, in different areas of the brain. And they found that a simple intervention, if you show, for example, people pictures of war or whatever, and you tell them, look at them without judgment. Look at them without judgment. This is a simple instruction. Your, the brain areas that are fired in your mind is different than when you tell them, look at them the way you look at them. So the, so the brain is very sensitive to the attitude that you take. And if you practice over a long period of time, like eight weeks or more, then you start having structural changes to the brain. The prefrontal cortex in this area becomes thicker, the gray cells, and we will see why this area is important for us and for the executive. And the second area that is important is the amygdala in the middle of our brain, the limbic system, that has to do with our emotions. And the connection between the two, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, is modulated based on our interests. For example, if we are very emotional, and in some instance, the prefrontal cortex sends signals to calm the amygdala. Okay? And the amygdala are connected to other areas of the brain. So this is extremely powerful that uh, as you practice mindfulness, there are structural changes that happen to the brain. And they are documented in many, many studies that have been replicated all over the world. So impact on, our, on the constituents, what happens then to our experience? Our perception, we start having equity of vision, and equity of perception and depth of vision. And there is an exercise, I don't know whether you are familiar with the reason exercise in mindfulness, did somebody do it? Okay, I hope you know that. It enlivens your senses, and our senses are somewhat asleep. We have to enliven our senses in order to live a better life. 
And there are exercises to enliven your senses. The second one is emotional reason. reason. The second one is, uh, I will put it on the website that I will tell you about later on. The second one is the feelings and emotions. And I know that we have experts in emotional intelligence. And mindfulness, yes, we did it. Yes, yeah, you took the course with me. Did you like it? Okay, the feelings. The way we, uh, the studies have been made about uh, about emotions is that emotion has a life cycle, which means it, it rises and then it drops. And uh, it, it is prone to, to make us reactive to incidents. And it has a valence or a tone, which means positive or a negative tone. Mindfulness at, 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 you know, affects the life cycle, which means if we have anger, it lasts less. It will last less. And we will be less reactive to incidents. And uh, there will be more emotions that are more positive in our experience. The third one is cognitive capacity and cognitive flexibility. If you remember, we said that uh, everything is becoming complex, but our minds are not evolving. So you need something to evolve on your mental level. And the way it's working is that the working memory, which means the memory that we need in order to analyze the situation, becomes faster, it becomes bigger. So which means we can hold different pieces of information to analyze a problem. Different pieces. Huh? So our mind has a better, bigger capacity. And then we started having more fluid intelligence. Fluid intelligence that is needed to, to adapt and also that is needed to be more creative. And we start developing something what we call divergent thinking, which means uh, we start, uh, we, we, you know, we start becoming creative and more problem solving, trying to able to find solutions better. And then our behavior changes, and we start having reduced automaticity and self-regulation of behavior. Uh, if you look at automaticity, the, you know, if we, we truly analyze what we are doing and how we are living, you will see that 85% of our behavior and our thinking and our feeling is pre-programmed. There is nothing new in it. It is happening automatically. Even when you think you are deciding on something, your brain has decided before you, 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 know, you know it. Do you know that? There are studies that, that now uh, you know, point that even when you decide something uh, unconsciously, you have decided for it before you decide consciously about it. And this is due to automaticity, that you know we are living our lives in, on automatic control, auto autopilot. And mindfulness wants us to stop this automaticity when it is not in our advantage. It is not like automaticity is bad. It's too much automaticity is bad. Like we said, too much activate, activation of the sympathetic system is bad. And we are, we are being very automatic in our behavior. And that's why we need to slow down, pause, and feel our body signals before we, we respond rather than react. So um, now we are probably a little bit ready to stop and to do a simple breathing exercise, which is the foundation again, before we carry on to the application of mindfulness. If you mind, or if, uh, if uh, some people do not want to do this breathing exercise, they are welcome to just, you know, uh, stay uh, uh, quiet and, and let, us, uh, let us do it. Now, uh, these are just a few points uh, to instruct you about the exercise. Uh, any uh, mindfulness exercise, uh, you know, recruits three areas, the body, the brain, and the mind. And the body, we, we need to sit comfortably and feel the contact of the body with the surrounding. And then our breath, we need to breathe naturally, not in a forced way. So if I tell you, put your attention on the breath, I'm not inviting you to breathe too slowly or to breathe uh, heavily. And then uh, you can feel the breath. The, the, the question is to feel the breath, not to think about the breath. Now, when we say feel the breath, it means you want to feel the sensation of the breath in your body. And there are four areas that you can notice when you are feeling the breath, either in the nostrils or in the back of the throat, or the chest rising and uh, falling, or the abdomen rising and falling, whichever is more uh, comfortable or suitable for you. 
And then the mind, what we do with the mind as we are doing this exercise. Of course, this is new to you, so too many things to put. You need a lot of working memory and a lot of practice to do that. But the third one is the mind. What we are advising is that you focus on the breath, and then, of course, your mind will wander. And why your mind will wander? Yes. Because it's natural for it to do so. So as it wanders, what do we do in mindfulness? We acknowledge, and then we we bring back, but how, with, with, with what attitude? Non-judgment and acceptance. So this is very, very important, that, oh, my mind has wandered. It's not like the end of the world. So you don't feel alarmed. My mind should not wander. There is no should in mindfulness. You just notice, and then you get back to the brain. Okay. Can you direct your wandering, for instance, you planning to change your mindset? Yeah, I mean, you can at some stage. You can. We will see how how we can follow because this mind wandering follows four steps, and I'm gonna talk about it after we do. So now we're gonna do the mindful breathing. Maybe we can turn down a little bit the lights if you can, and then I will sit with you here and guide you for the five minutes. So we sit comfortably in our chair. We lower our gaze or close our eyes, whatever we feel more comfortable to do. We put our hands in our lap or in our knees. And we, we have our back straight away from the back of the chair if possible. So our spine is straight, our shoulders are relaxed, our head is erect. We feel our whole body sitting in a dignified manner, our feet on the floor. We take a breath. We feel the sensation of the body on the chair, our bottom, on the back of the chair. We feel our hands on our knees and our lap. What do we feel there? What do we sense? Is it hot? Is it cool? And we feel our feet on the ground. What's the sensation that we feel there? Now slowly and gently, we move our attention to the breath. The breath in and the breath out. We notice the breath as it enters the nostrils. What sensation do we have? Is it of freshness, cool, warm? We follow the breath as it goes into the nostrils. As it goes in the back of the throat, the chest, the abdomen, How the breath slows down, stops, and reverts as an out breath. Let's take three rounds of breath in and out, feeling the breath, not thinking about it. With every in-breath, we think about acceptance, we have the attitude of acceptance. With, ev with every out-breath, we let go. In, 
out in out in out in silence we do a couple of more breaths and we feel the breath either at the nostrils or at the back of the throat, or the chest, or the abdomen, wherever it feels more comfortable. We don't manipulate the breath, we let it go freely and flow freely in our body. We can draw a little smile on our face if we can. If a thought arises, or a sensation, or an emotion, or an image, we acknowledge it, and we gently go back to the breath. If another one mind wandering happens, we do the same. It's natural for our minds to wander, and however the many times it wanders, we acknowledge and we gently bring back our attention to the breath. Now we practice in silence until I give you a signal, come back. Slowly, slowly, we bring our attention to our feet now. The feet touching the ground, the sensation of the feet touching the ground. And the sensation of the buttocks on the chair. To our eyes, we open gently and slowly our eyes. I would like to invite like each two or three of you to just maybe share a little bit of your experience before I I ask you about your your experience of the moment and of your work. So I'll give you a couple of minutes maybe to discuss with each other if you like your experience of, of these five minutes of, of mindful breathing. The person that is close to you can discuss.
felt uh, relaxed, a bit sleepy, uh, peaceful, and some of us felt a bit distracted. Okay, that's good. And one more behind you. Yes. Um, as for the posture, it was not very relaxing for me, but um, uh, as I always read about uh, how we have to uh, live our moment and avoid uh, our past memories and how to live with our life, um, and avoiding the anxieties of the future. They all speak about the one thing that how we can focus on our breath in order to live the moment. However, um, when, you, when you focus on the breath, how could that have this link with, uh, with the actual life? Rather than only the breath, how to focus on breath? That's what, what okay. was, uh, my question. Okay. Uh, how can how can we relate it to our life, take life to the team, so that we can uh, like, uh, correlate it with, uh, with our, our practices through the day, not just only uh, through the breath that we didn't know. Very good. Anybody likes to? Okay, please. Last one. <laughs> Um, actually, I was aware that I have a backache, <laughs> and uh, w once I remembered uh, something that made me stressful, I was distracted by what you were saying. 
So the sentences that you were saying along with the breathing helped me to detach this thought. Please, okay. Very good. Thank you. One more? The stopping uh, judgment uh, character, does it make us indifferent? Does it uh, enhance indifference? That's why uh, this, uh, this is the, the question, yes. the first yes. question. The second, uh, does it uh, involve silence or soft music or uh, what uh, kind of uh, atmosphere uh, makes us uh, really into this? Uh, yes, very good. Very good. Um, you know, um, I've been teaching mindfulness, and all the answers that I heard today actually uh, there are uh, answer, there are quest all the questions that I heard today and the comments are somewhat familiar, but of course each one has its own flavor depending how you are living it. Uh, mindfulness is not about inducing a state of relaxation, and is not in the is not a state of directly inducing a state of relaxation or of calmness. It is indirect which means that we know that we are all looking for calmness and relaxation, whatever, but it is not yoga to relax. It is not a technique to relax. It's a technique to just bring you to the present. And the present to, to face the present, whatever it is. So if you say, I am bored, I'm gonna applaud you. If you say, I don't feel like doing it, it is very good. It is not like, you know, I'm, I'm soliciting answers that please my ears or that make prove that mindfulness is a, is a technique. That, uh, you see, most of the time we feel disconnected uh, from our experience and we favor only the ones that we want to favor, something that is pleasurable, which is understandable. But we avoid the experiences that are not pleasurable, okay? Uh, so, uh, mindfulness is simply to register and to observe what we are passing through, okay? And the more we are, uh, we are comfortable in living what we are passing through with no judgment, everything falls in place. Oh, you tell me how it happened. It happens because your body helps you to recover. Now you know that if the temperature, for example, changes in our room or if we are in the mountains and cold, uh, you know, our bodies, homeostasis, you know, stasis, you know, everything happens, everything happens in your body without your permission. Your body is having a lot of uh, reactions, transformations, transfer of things in order to keep the balance. And it also wants to help you psychologically if you tune in to it. We don't trust our bodies. We don't want to feel our bodies. Not, I mean, we, of course, we cannot generalize. And we want our bodies to look like models. So we go and do, you know, and do all kinds of exercises. But we don't have a relationship with our bodies that is healthy exactly as they are, and exactly as it feels. I mean, when a girl said, I felt my back pain, okay? We need to connect with everything that we have that if you believe in God, that God has given us, we need to connect with everything that we have. And if we run from our bodies, and if we run through judgment about things, then uh, we will be missing how we deal with it in this complex world that we spoke about, this bukkha. Okay, the world is becoming complex, and this disconnection is creating a lot of mental diseases. And the first thing is to connect without too much judgment. If you feel that you are judging at the moment, mindfulness tells you, acknowledge your judgment. This is not judgment. When you are judging and you say, oh, I'm judging now, this is not judgment. Yes. So it's uh, non judgment, the, the broad meaning of it, is to accept the experience as it is occurring. Okay? It's not like, say, I want an, only a special kind of experience, only an experience that takes me here, that takes me there, that, you know, it's not that. It is feeling comfortable with, with whatever is happening. And then you say, so what is the guide for action? So how do I act if I feel comfortable with everything? You trust what needs to happen, and you go the way that you are always afraid to take. Mindfulness, you know, gives you this, yes. Can you give us an example of how not being judgmental about the present or the situation 
for example, and yeah. accept the present. The present. You, know, you know, I mean, I'll give you a personal experience. When I started, you know, I say, I'm an experimental guy. With see, like, you know, I try to see whether it works or not. And this is what I encourage you to do. Like, if you are in a situation against a person, against, you know, you don't like this person, you don't like this situation, you don't like yourself, you say, okay, let me try as an experiment and say, I'm not going to judge myself harshly this time. And I'm going to see what happens in the next five minutes. I'm not going to judge this person the next time. I'm going to see what happens. And the cases that I had in our MBA, you know, class, that one of the girls had a problem with her boss all the time. There was negativity, and uh, there was even abuse from her boss. And then I told her, try not to judge him, nor to judge yourself. Just suspend judgment for a while and see what happens. And in her experience after one week, she told me that everything fell into place, and her boss looked at her, and he changed without asking him to change. You know? By just feeling her body in front of her boss, not feeling her boss, feeling her body in front of her, feeling that she is afraid of him, that she doesn't like him, that she whatever, and be non-judgmental about all of these feelings. All of a sudden, he looked at her, there was no threat, everything fell into place, you know? So, it's a different mode of, of dealing with, with, with conflict. It's a, it's a mode where you feel anchored in your body, and people sense it. They sense that you are not threatened by, by you know, verbal abuse, by feelings, by whatever. So we bring you back to your body. Your body and mind are connected. They are connected through the breath. The more you are familiar and you become a close to your, to your breath and your body, your mind falls into place. Your mind is the monkey, the one that is jumping to the, uh, all the time. You know, searching and jumping. Your body is anchored. You have it with you wherever you go. And your breath is also with you. And your breath is the regulator of your body and mind. So every time you feel your body and your breath and you start feeling comfortable, all the negative emotions within you, they start melting away. And then you act the way you want. Your options become bigger. Because the automaticity of responding immediately to a pattern that you had before becomes less. We believe that we need to act, but, uh, but analyze your action. It's an only automatic. There's nothing you know, new about uh, responding to a person that you don't like with, uh, by a shout or by avoiding this person or whatever. What is new? You are doing it. You know, this is not action. This is what they call reaction. And what we, are, what we want you to develop is what is called response. So it is not a reaction, it is a response. We are living in a reactive mode. We want to activate our response mode. Uh, we fall into indifference. No, at all. You see, judgment colors your vision. If you are prejudging a person, you start selecting whatever suits you. If a person, if you dislike a person, you, you, you overlook everything positive or everything neutral about that person. Isn't that the same as emotional intelligence? The one component of mindfulness is emotional intelligence. But when you look at the five that I drew, it has an awareness component, an emotion component, a sensory component, a cognitive component, and a behavioral component. And they are all linked together. It's not spiritual. Okay, you see, it has spiritual roots and one has to admit it. I'm not running away from saying that it has Buddhist roots and uh, Hindu roots and whatever. Actually, I wrote a study and I, I did a lot of research about Hinduism and Buddhism and I found the, the original texts that talk about mindfulness. One of them in Hinduism is called the Muttaka Upanishad. It's very famous about how to develop meta-awareness and it's a beautiful text. And I'm very fond of Eastern philosophies, although I'm a Christian and I practice my Christianity. And also, I, there was in, the, in, in Buddhist texts, there are two sutras only about mindfulness. One is called Anapanasati Sutta, which is a breathing sutra. And the other one is called Maha uh, Satipatthana Sutta, which is the sutra about the four mindfulnesses that I spoke about. I made them five in my study. So uh, it is very pronounced. And uh, it is very clear how it is. However, 
I find it much more interesting when it uh, migrated from the east to the west. You know, nothing happens unless there's a merger of civilizations. We should have open minds. The world has become one global village, and good ideas fly, fly from right to left. You just have to take whatever suits you and whatever and ingredient suits you. Mindfulness taken from the West without the dogma to the West, without the dogma of Buddhism and the religious practices. You only take the component of attention and attention to a breath. I don't see any threat there or any indoctrination there. I mean, you don't have to be a believer mm. to be able to do uh, mindfulness. Well, it's breath and body. So if you're and a believer, you, know. you, you, can't, you become a deeper believer. If you're not a believer, it's up to you, you know, it's just breath and body, and there are studies commemorating it. We're not talking about, you know, putting a candle and looking at a person or worshipping any deity. Mm. Yes? Uh, do you think there is a contradiction between uh, Oh, this is a big question that I would like if you invite me to another lecture to do it. Because, you know, this is a deep question and we need, I think, to start to continue moving to mindfulness at work, don't you think? Yes. 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 So he decided, he was talking to a person. And then he did the movement again. The person asked, but the fly was, was gone, why did you do it again? He said, because the first time I did it without mindfulness. Very good. So now let's carry on, if you don't mind, with uh, how we apply mindfulness to teams, to leadership teams and organizations. Now, and there are documented studies about the uh, benefits of mindfulness, and it is documented in these two uh, major studies that it affects employee well-being, employee performance, and organization outcomes, including agility and innovation. And we're going to talk about the importance of agility now as a, as a new construct rather than efficiency that is becoming very important. Now, you cannot manage other people unless you manage yourself first. You know Peter Drucker. Most of you have heard about him. So uh, the whole exercise of uh, personal development starts by developing yourself. And if you want to manage yourself, you need to what to know. You know you need to uh, know oneself. So you cannot manage yourself without knowing yourself. And to know yourself, there are dark areas that others see in you that you don't see. And there are areas, you know, that uh, neither you nor others see about you. So there's a lot of unknown. You are only living probably in this quarter, but you don't know what others uh, may, may see, known to others and unknown to self. So it's very important to see that uh, the reality of yourself is not exactly as you see yourself, as probably others see, or that remains unknown to you and to others. Now, as a leader or as a person in business, you need to know that you, you, you are asked to manage so many things, and that's why we feel ourselves scattered in management. You need to first manage yourself. You need to manage your team members individually. I mean, who of you has a team that reports for them? No. Very good. Yeah, team of uh, yeah, instructors or whatever. So you see that you need to manage each and every one of them. And then you need to manage the whole team as a team, as a whole. And this is the mindfulness concept of team mindfulness. And then you need to manage the tasks that are and uh, that are uh, you asked to do. And also you are you need to manage other teams and organizations, not only you know your team and organization. So if you are not anchored and uh, grounded in the center. You lose, you lose perspective, you are not able to manage these things. So being in the center is very important. And being in the center connects you to the other four. They are all connected. Now, managing attention is the single most important determinant of business success. In the future, whoever is able to manage their attention, they will be the winner. And this attention, look at her, 
you know, drawing a uh, bow and arrow. You cannot think about the past and the future while you are thinking about the target or you are aiming at the target. So you have to live the moment, right? So that's why the moment and living the moment is important. Now, our minds are jumping from past to future, and this is a problem. So what happens when we practice mindfulness? The first quality that we start uncovering is what we call attention stability, which means our mind wandering becomes less for the ones that are asked about wandering, and the attention is stabilized on the present. Attention control becomes more, so we are less stationed by distraction. And the attention efficiency, more economical use of attention resources. This is extremely important. We start being attentive without uh, striving, without uh, spending a lot of energy. Now, these are two areas that we spoke about in the brain, the prefrontal cortex and the limbic brain. And the uh, healthy mind is, is, a, is, a health, is a mind where these two, peop, uh, two areas are functioning properly and are connected properly for regulation and attenuation of signals that are off. So this is how mindfulness helps us develop this area, the prefrontal, which is our executive mind, the executive skills that we have. And the limbic brain, which is the, the, the area of two things that are important, attraction and repulsion, anger and reward mechanisms which means like when we feel that we'll be rewarded something, this is the area in the middle that is an action. And addictions, all types of addictions, smoking, you know, drugs, and uh, it is in that area that becomes dysfunctional, the area in the middle. So your mind cannot function, the executive mind cannot control your middle area. So uh, the little study that I did is that mindfulness really can gather the most important theories of leadership. And these are the four leadership. By being present, you have presence leadership in the middle. By being able to feel and feel without fear, you become authentic. This is authentic leadership. And by uh, starting becoming, developing a little bit more intelligence, you start having interconnectedness and relational leadership. And by being, uh, by doing things differently, like ask the questions about what action shall we do, you become transformational. You start doing actions that before you never thought that you can do. And this is the real transformation. So it, in a way it groups four, four theories of, and, and the grounded mind uh, is in the middle. Grounded is to be mentally and emotionally stable, admirably sensible, realistic, and unpretentious. Ian Webster definition of grounded leadership. Okay, and as you become a mindful leader, you are developing all of these qualities. Now for the team. So you have teams. Have you seen this?
Now, for the new environment, the VUCA environment, where do you think is the most suitable? Which, which quadrant is the most suitable in a VUCA environment? Okay, Adocracy. But not for all, uh, not for all organizations. But in general, uh, this is the advocacy. You need to be flexible, and you need inwardly and outwardly. I would put it here. Yeah. And what happens, you need to have a range, a circle, where you are able to be agile to move uh, uh, very fast, depending upon the cues and the signals that you have. So it's not anymore you want to be in one quadrant. You want to be moving from one area to the other, but centered in the middle. You are inwardly and outwardly. You are flexible and stable. Can you do that? Flexible and stable, inwardly and outwardly. Yes. This is mindfulness. That's why we say you go back to your body and you feel what's happening outside. So this is inward, outward. And you are stable in your breath because breath is happening and is stable. And you are flexible at the same time. You are feeling what arises and what goes into the realm of your experience. This is extremely deep. Yes. Very good. Good question. Uh, there are studies that uh, that uh, where they had only the team leader practicing mindfulness. There was an influence on the team that was reported by the team as being positive. Okay. Uh, so uh, there is an influence when you are only practicing, and when your team is practicing, then of course the the, the influence becomes uh, more pronounced. And organization culture, you know a little, there is information, there is informal culture as well, where there's a lot of unknown and where people behave differently than what they think they say they are doing. And this is a big problem in ethics and in what's happening in companies is that they can proclaim very high values of very things, whereas whatever is hidden is totally different. So authenticity in organization building is extremely important. We keep it until the end, okay? Because we'll, we'll open the floor. I just want to finish now. Then. Huh? And then this is the SAP example. SAP is one of the largest software companies in the world. It has you know more than 95,000 employees. And it has more uh, around 378,000 customers, over 180 countries. They started in 12, 2012. The name of the person that was in charge of development, his name is Peter Bostelman. He started with three centers where they started uh, experimenting with mindfulness. And then now they have more than 7,500 trained in mindfulness and 5,000 on the uh, plus 5,000 on the wait list. This is in October 2018. And they have, they have made two, more than 200 uh, mindful trainings in 48 locations in 26 countries. What happened? The business impact results on an organizational level, they measured that employee engagement went up. Leadership trust index, there's a trust the relationship between the team leader and the team. And absenteeism of employees went down. And there were 200 plus return on investment from the less days in absenteeism and also more productivity of employees. Yes, yes. And that's why it's becoming extremely important now. To, and look at them. Here they are all doing like the breathing exercise that we did today. Uh, the kickoff uh, of one of the trainings that they do. And look what happened on a personal level, reported by people, that uh, overall happiness, well-being, personal sense of meaning and satisfaction, ability to focus one thing at a time. Remember, focus is important and attention. And clarity and creativity, it increased. And you know that in, the, in this tech company, very advanced, uh, you need the harness as much as you can, the mental uh, capacity of your people and their well-being. Uh, it's extremely important. So, uh, and uh, they, they feel less overwhelmed as well. Okay, and this is at four weeks and after six months. So you see uh, whether they've been preserved. One of the questions was, can we preserve these benefits after a while, after the course?
Am I using my strength best in my current position? What are the next steps in my future career development? Or how can I improve my work-life balance, just to mention a few? The topics I specialize in, however, are resilience and burnout. And the pillar of my work is mindfulness. My mission is to bring mindfulness to the workplace to obtain greater employee engagement and well-being, which in turn leads to a more productive workplace with happy and motivated employees. In today's globally acting digital world, being online 24-7, reading emails, texting, having conference calls at all times of the day and in the evenings, it is easy to experience situations in which you feel overloaded and exhausted, get absorbed by your daily work, and forget about yourself completely. But what exactly is mindfulness? It's all about changing your mindset. It's about being aware of what is happening in this very moment in a non-judgmental way. Integrating your mind, your heart, and your body. Sound simple? Sure, but it's definitely not easy. If you think about how rarely we really are aware what, that we're thinking, or that our thoughts are drifting off, remorsing about the past, or worrying about the future, how rarely we are aware of how we're feeling, angry, sad, ashamed, or embarrassed, or how rarely we are aware of what signals our body is sending us, headaches, rapid heartbeat, or chest pain. What's in it for me, you might ask? Well, with mindfulness, you can build resilience, that is, increase your ability to deal with difficult and stressful situations. Be more focused on the tasks you are currently working on, Enhance your empathy and compassion by learning to take on others' perspectives instead of reacting to their actions with annoyance. And here's a 10 minutes guided meditation to start a corporate event. So it's a little bit longer than what we did. So you imagine all these buses, you know, that are uh, into software and into going all over the world. They are practicing together. It creates a big atmosphere, a big wave. There is no dogma, there is no figures, and no uh, recitation of anything. So just being in the present and each one on his own, or each one on her own. Now, mindful organizations, what happens is that they become good in sensing and vigilance. They create, you create a climate of safety, voice, and trust, and there are studies that you, they, they will become, you know, you have a team, if they're not working together, you are losing a lot of resources. What is this organization when everybody's fighting with everybody? Nothing is gonna come, good is going to come out of it. And then uh, critical skills of rational reasoning versus intuition and creativity. And I heard about the intuition from somebody today, and the importance of intuition. And uh, rational thinking, you start becoming more inductive and deductive. You, are, you start understanding how you can draw conclusions and how you analyze root cause uh, situations. Uh, there, are, there, is, there are many times flaws in our way of analyzing things. And uh, you become more experimental in entrepreneurship because when you are living in the present, you are open to more possibilities. You moved away from automaticity which means you are, you are now on your own to experiment something new. And this is what we call experimentation. It happens on a personal level, and it happens also on an organization level. And then learning orientation, learning becomes important. And uh, you start, uh, and all organizations that are successful have a learning as a major ingredient uh, you know, in, their, in their development. So the way forward, the team, the leader, the team, the organization, and then we have these things to develop. Uh, I'll be putting on the website mindful listening, looking, and talking. And these are important ingredients in communication to make it successful. So please tune in the, the updates on the website. And uh, the five mindful advice. Notice the activity you're engaged in during the day. This is one, one of the questions was about what, how do you practice it? And then catch your judging mind. Every time you are judging somebody or yourself or the task, relax and think about non-judgment. Think mindfulness, one of the definitions of it in the Buddhist scriptures is sati or remembrance. 
if you if you just remember that not to judge is a big quality in itself and feel more you feel the sensation of your body don't shun away from sensation savor your sensory experiences when you see something nice and beautiful acknowledge it and move from self to other orientation uh, to be self-absorbed is, is a big problem you have to open up and the way to open up is to start feeling relaxed within yourself and these are how to encourage mindfulness in your workplace remember to breathe notice the little things around you and get up and take a break once and then allow gap time between meetings ask challenging questions look at your response from another point of view lead with emotional connection lead by example give people time to dream and teach people how to how to practice mindfulness this is from Forbes, a recent article about it that i will also put it under references that you can uh, look into the website this is my website i call it mindful lebanon because i truly feel that uh, there is a message to uh, different sections to become mindful and please register your name in case of interest that you want me to send you emails or updates or the newsletter that I'm planning to do. These are references, very professional references. There are many more I have, uh, but that I used in this presentation. And Albert Camus, a French author that I like very much, an existentialist, real generosity toward the future lies in giving all to the present. So if you're not living in the present, you're not doing anything for the future. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yes. A lot about emotions uh, and how mindfulness will regulate emotions, etc. How about physical pain? Physical pain. Very good. The uh, MBSR started with physical pain. And your question uh, is very important. I hope that the other people, uh, you know, when you have physical pain, you are shot in general by two arrows, they call it. The first arrow is the physical reason, the physical basis of your pain. And the second one is the psychological add-on component that came with your physical pain. Understand? So your, your pain is compounded by a physical and by an emotional. So uh, mindfulness first eliminates the, the mental and the emotional pain. It, it eliminates. Well, I mean, it, it, more or less, depending upon the people and the fact. And this is what people with chronic yes. illnesses exactly. and pain, this is, that's why it became successful. Because it removes what we call the second arrow, which is the arrow that is coming from the emotional tension. Once it's removed it from the from the from your mind and from your body, what you are left with is the raw feeling of pain. Yes. The raw feeling of pain. And this raw feeling goes on and off. So you have moments where you are drinking and you're not feeling your raw pain. And some other times it comes and you are able to bend. So, it, in principle, your pain goes by 50% at least when you are practicing mindfulness, your physical pain. Because you are removing the emotional component and the mental and the psychological component out of it. Because when you have a chronic saying, oh, I'm going to die, I'm, I'm going backwards, no, I, I cannot do this, I cannot do this. All of these, when you start removing them, you are left by a raw feeling. And this raw feeling is more bearable than all of these add-ons that you have. Sir, is it important to start it with a group like you did today? Is it start exercising it? Everyone, please. Huh? Uh, <laughs> is it good to start it, or is it uh, important to start it in a group like we did today and with someone like yes. you? Uh, because right there's some kind of discipline, I mean, here. Alone, maybe we get the distractions more. Uh, well, uh, the, the way to do it is, is of course, to, uh, to follow a full course and then to have a group meetings and also retreats, what we call and we call supervision. Um, I'm doing one, for example. In, in, in May, I'm spending one week in Portugal for, to, as supervision, uh, teacher supervision. And the retreats you do because, and then to share experiences because you know what you discover with mindfulness 
is our common humanity as a factor. We're not sitting that you see that uh, your pain, what you're passing through, is, is, is basically something that is common to everybody, that you are not alone. And it validates your own pain, your own struggles, and when you see that others do have something in a way similar. So, um, the, sh the sharing thing. Sure. That's why, in some cases, it is, it is used as my, it's case as a community service. They are experimenting it in the UK in some circles where uh, people are brought together because uh, they are lonely, and you bring them, and then there's something happening when when they sit together and they discuss a few things on their mind in an atmosphere that is safe and secure for people to talk. There's no coercion and no urgency for people to. Uh, to, to share their experiences, but simply by sitting and listening, something yeah, can change. Something in the present moment can change within them. Uh, so you're not forcing change. How long is the retreat? How long? There are retreats of one day, there are retreats of two, three days, or so there's silence. Yeah. But uh, for the supervision, it's one week usually. Once a year, I mean, for if you are a teacher, if you are a retreat once every six months, one day, or something. Have a question. I have one more question. Yeah. Okay, so I have two questions. Um, does mindfulness uh, help with music therapy? Yeah. And what about, uh, does it also help with the virtual reality, with virtual training? Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Uh, good questions. First, that there are specific exercises to train the mind, on, to train the sound, the, the, the hearing on mindfulness. Huh? So um, uh, you, 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 you give attention to the sound, and then you feel, you, you start feeling whatever you're feeling, you let, it, you let it arise, you know, and you are in the moment with the sound. And this is a beautiful exercise. Sitting meditation has some portion about uh, sounds in general. But we don't analyze sounds. We just, and we just feel our uh, experience with the sound. It's a beautiful nuance that you start developing when you hear the sound without too much analyzing. We want to go a little bit from what we call conceptual processing to experiential processing, which means that you are recruiting all your body and mind to live that experience rather than think about it in a very in rational terms. We don't analyze the music, we feel it. Obviously, this topic is Beautiful. Yeah, yes. it is. The challenge of uh, the culture. The, let's talk about the local, national culture and the challenge that you would be faced with when you are going to send this thing to cor corporations and to companies. Uh, yeah, uh, what is making me feel comfortable is that I do not want to sell and I do not want to convince. Okay, not even that. <laughs> not even. I just say whatever I, I'm, uh, I'm saying, you know, and then the people, uh, they just resonate or they don't. And it's not a big deal whether they do or whether they don't. Yeah. So it's, you know, people that they feel it has some value somewhere, you know, and that's enough. No, uh, no need, no need to really uh, to to overthink because again, our mind, you know, our our mind uh, thinking about problems all the time. I was one that uh, until recently I was over analyzing things. You know, you just have to enjoy the moment as it is. I remember when I used to visit my master, in, in, I used to go with like ten questions, and then I go there and uh, tea is served, and then I don't have any questions. I'm just present, you know. There was this presence. There's nothing to ask. I don't feel all the questions disappear. In in a moment of presence, there is your mind quietens. You know. Uh, as a team leader or a manager, and I want to practice mindfulness at work, and I want to apply it also, and I want my team to practice mindfulness. How we can start doing it? In you know, five minutes a day, I do mindfulness yeah. breathing for me and my team. Well, you day. have the principles. You can always talk about intention, attention, and attitude. Then yeah. Let us sit together and not judge each other. Let us really try to be empathetic and listen to each other and give each other the space and the time to express themselves. 
Yes. And then you will see that there are small miracles that happen, mm -hmm. that people, you know, feel more safe and comfortable to talk and to contribute. Excellent. So judgment is about ju not judging myself and not judging others. Correct. Only. And, and but when it comes to idea, only, uh, I mean... What do you mean only or not only? only? Because sometimes there are some ideas or to, we have to solve problems. <laughs> Yes. We need to be so, somehow judgmental, yeah, when, when it comes to ideas, not, not my relationship with others, not intrapersonal and interpersonal, but when there are some ideas, decisions, yes. decisions uh, problem solving, I need to be judgmental. Yes, of course, yes. but you make decisions when others are buying in, are participating, it's yes. better than when you, when you tell them that they are wrong and you are right. You know? yes. And many times when you see, when you do such uh, exercises, you will see that uh, there's something emerges from the group that is better than each uh, individual's contribution. Yes. And unless, if you're not able to reach that level, then your idea versus my idea is not the correct one, it's not the best one. Yes. The best idea is the one that springs from the group, as we said, that is group mindfulness, which yes. means that uh, they, uh, they start contributing and making it better and better because they are buying in and they are working on it. Okay, it's bringing peacefulness to you and you have this contribution. Starts with putting this piece on the side. This is the. Uh, this is the. Uh, Grounded, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Any more questions?